Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to look at quotidian choices, the choices we make every day. With me is Stephen Schwartz, who is a, an experienced parapsychology researcher, the author of many books, including The Secret Vaults of Time, The Alexandria Project, Opening to Infinity, and The Eight Laws of Change, How to Be an Agent for Social Transformation. Welcome, Stephen. A pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And uh, I love your emphasis on quotidian choices. First, because it was a word I didn't know about <laughs> until I looked it up when I saw You're it not alone. In, in your book. But second, because it's, it's, it's an avenue f that everybody can participate in. We all make quotidian choices. We just don't know it. Yes, that's, that is, in fact, the, the key to the thing. It's not just big gatherings. Demonstrations are very helpful because they are public expressions of collective intention. But it is the real change is change of attitude. And that's demonstrations evoke from us a real commitment for social change mm -hmm. because we see that so many other people are involved and, and you just sort of feel the rush of the thing. But the key to it is this issue of collective intention. And it gets expressed not just in big meetings, but just day to day. Mm -hmm. And I discovered as I did the research on social transformation that, and I can give you some examples of this. In fact, let me give an example to make my point. You know, the difference between gay and LGBT Yes. If you do a Google word search, and you know, you, Google keeps track of how many times people search on things, you can see that a, it's been about two years now, maybe a little over, that there was a shift that happened between gay to LGBT. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the president didn't go on television and say, from now on, we're going to say LGBT instead of gay. Nobody passed a rule. The Congress didn't speak out on it. Quite the contrary. Um, it was the result of literally millions of individuals who, when they would have said gay, said LGBT, which is not just a change in terminology, not just a different term, but it's a different conception of gender and sexuality mm -hmm. and what it means to be a human. It's certainly more inclusive. Well, not only more inclusive, but it's a whole different way of looking at gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And it occurred not because anybody passed a rule or, or somebody, some major public figure yeah. came out and espoused it, but because ordinary people made this mm -hmm. change. You can look at marriage equality as another example, or you can look at smoking. You know, it's not illegal to smoke. Right. And yet, only about 11% of us do smoke. Well, it is illegal to smoke in, indoors in many yes, in, in places. Yes, now, but I mean... Not here it, in Nevada, but... Yes, but <laughs> I mean, it, didn't, it wasn't something that happened because they passed a law right. about it. It resulted from individual choices. Well, if you begin to think like that, you know, my wife, goes when she goes shopping, she has a list of, of companies whose policies are not life-affirming for their employees or they're producing toxic wastes that they're not taking care mm -hmm. of or they're exploiting some group or something for mm -hmm. whatever reason. And she doesn't ever buy those, she shouldn't buy their products. Mm -hmm. Which that's a, something everybody could do. Could do, exactly. Yeah. That's, that, that's what I was going to try to think exactly. That's an example it. of a quotidian choice. That's right. Quotidian just means commonplace, ordinary, mundane. Yeah. Something you do every day. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, you go into the market and you buy toothpaste or cat food or you fill up your tank with gas. Yeah. Do you know anything about the company? Do you know anything about their way they treat their employees? Do you know about their environmental policies? Probably not, because we don't ever think in that term. But if you think about every choice that you're making is essentially a kind of vote. And if it's a financial transaction, you are voting either to support the policies of one company or not support them. Mm -hmm. And so out of that came, I, I developed from the research, the Quotidian Pledge. And I tell people this, and it seems almost unbelievable, but we have to add one more part, and that is Van Rensselaer Polytech Institute did a lot of research on how many people does it take to produce change. Mm. And the answer to the question is it takes 10%. 10%? 10%. Whenever 10% uh -huh. of a cohort, whether it's a schoolroom or a church group or a community or a nation, mm -hmm. whenever 10% change their consciousness about something, the whole cohort tips. Mm -hmm. And so I say to people, and I will say to the people who are watching this, mm -hmm. which ultimately will be thousands. Yes. And those thousands, those of you who are watching this, seeing this, you can change the course of history. You don't have to have an army. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have an official position. Here's all you have to do. Every day you are faced with thousands of choices. We just do it in the normal course. Mm -hmm. Become aware you're making a choice. Educate yourself as to what that choice means. Of the choices that are available to you in that moment, consistently and always choose that option which is the most compassionate and life-affirming. Now, none of them may be perfect, but inevitably, one is always at least a little better, a little more compassionate, a little more life-affirming. And if you will make that choice, today I make this pledge. From now on, I will be A, aware that I'm making a choice. B, I will educate myself on what my choices mean. C, that of the options that are presented to me at that moment, as I understand it in that moment, not as I might have it a, a year ago or that I may a year in the future, as I understand it in that moment, I will consistently choose the option that is most compassionate and life-affirming. I will tell 10 people that I am doing this as a discipline. I will invite them to join me, and I will ask them that they in turn ask their friends to also join them. Mm -hmm. So let's just say, I don't know, you have 10,000 people that are watching, okay? So 10,000 people start. Well, then it becomes 100,000. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes a million. Then it becomes 10 million. Then it becomes 100 million. We have to get 31.8 million people to change their consciousness. So, in the United States. Well, in the United States. Because we have a global audience. Yes, yes, but, yeah. but okay, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, there, all right, let's do it. There's 7 billion people. Right. So it takes 700 million, and we're almost there already. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so we start. We start with ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a hundred million. That's five leaps. Yeah. Well, at that point, in fact, at four leaps, you've already. If it's just ten thousand people in the United States, you've already changed the consciousness of the mm -hmm. United States. And when you look. When you actually read about people who make these changes, I'll give you an example. You look at the Quakers. Yes. In the United States today, there are about 87, less, a little bit less than 87,000 Quakers. A very small religion. It, well, it's so small, most people have never met a Quaker, have no idea what they believe, mm -hmm. don't know anything about them. And yet, if you and, and in the entirety of American history from the colonial period forward, there have been less than 500,000 Quakers. Mm -hmm. 
and you'd think this group is so small, how could they possibly make any difference? Mm -hmm. And yet when you look at every major progressive, compassionate, life-affirming, wellness-producing trend, abolition, women's suffrage, penal reform, public education, nuclear freeze, the environmental movement, marriage equality, what you discover is that that movement began with a tiny little group of Quakers. Mm -hmm. And so this little group of, of people who are so small that most people have never met one and will never meet one, have over the course of American history created as have been the in, the instigators of the major compassionate life affirming mm -hmm. social changes that have made America America and they've done it as you say by making small choices These every little day choices they live mm -hmm. the choices you know i like this idea uh, because william james in his essay on ethics says, well, we can divide you ethical decisions into what he calls the strenuous mood and the easygoing mood. Right. And, and it's the strenuous mood will always uh, do better than the easygoing mood. But the strenuous mood, to me, seems like too much effort for people. And what you're talking about here is kind of a balance yes. between them. It doesn't, you don't have to strain and stress to do this. You just have to be conscious to make your yes. choices every day. Exactly. It's, so it's a little bit more than easygoing, but it's not, it's not a huge burden on anybody. No, it's just, this is a matter of, of basically seeing these choices as votes. Mm -hmm. Do I want a a society which supports wellness and well-being, or do I want a society that has profit as its only social priority? And to give you an idea of what one person can do, just I, I, this is just one. Think about Thoreau. Mm -hmm. Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau, sitting next to his little pond, Walden Pond. I've actually been there. It's, just, yes. it's not a lake. It's a little <laughs> pond. Yeah. Sitting next to his pond, he writes an essay called Civil Disobedience. Yes. Mahatma Gandhi reads that essay. And that's the basis upon which he builds the entire movement that got India independence without a war. Mm -hmm. The only time in history that I know of that that's happened. In turn, Martin Luther King reads about Gandhi reading Thoreau he reads Thoreau along with Gandhi, and he models the American Civil Rights Movement on it. Mm -hmm. So one man sitting next to his little pond writes a little short essay, which in turn changes the world in three countries, India, Great Britain, and the United States. We never know what the implications of our actions are going to be. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we want to always opt for the compassionate and life-affirming choice because that produces a goal of wellness without inflicting a cherished outcome as to exactly how it has to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that phrase, cherished outcome. I know it has a particular meaning for you, and it, it often people who hold, as I understand your thinking, a cherished outcome often get the opposite of what they intend. Yes, frequently. I got this from the abolitionists. Mm -hmm. If you go back and read the, doc, the diaries, the correspondence, contemporaneous commentary about abolitionists, you, over and over you will see sentences like, I don't know whether slavery will end in my lifetime, and I don't know how it will end, but I am committed to doing everything I can to end it. Mm -hmm. And you see this over and over again in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. I'm working for this. I don't know how it's going to happen, yeah. but I want it to happen, and I want and I will serve that goal in every way I can, mm -hmm. recognizing that I may not ever see exactly how it happens and that it may not happen in my lifetime. So that's not a cherished outcome. Well, a cherished outcome is I want something to happen and this is how I want it to come. I want it to come in a blue box with a pink ribbon. Mm -hmm. Well, 
if it only can come in a blue box and a pink ribbon, it makes it very difficult for the great matrix of consciousness. Mm -hmm. All life is interdependent mm -hmm. and interconnected. So the idea of a cherished outcome is is sort of like my ego has to control yeah. the, uh, what happens here. Yes, yeah, so I only want it to happen in a certain way. Uh -huh, so but that when I you get do credit that, for it. Or, well, yeah. whether I get credit for yeah. it, but that means that it can only happen in a very limited way. Yeah. When the key to social transformation mm -hmm. is the collective intention. There is no power more potent than collective human intention. And so if you have a goal, I want slavery to end, I want marriage equality to occur, but you don't have a cherished outcome, that allows other people to join you in that collective intention. Mm -hmm. If you say, I want something to happen, but I only want it to happen in this way, then that eliminates other people. That's an yeah. exclusionist view, mm -hmm. not an inclusionist mm -hmm. view. If you are including, inclusive, then you, will, you invite all the other people who share that general goal mm -hmm. to come to work, and you don't know how it's going to yeah. happen because you don't have all the facts. Well, you've used words like compassion and uh, well-being as as sort of your ultimate values here. Yes, uh, and, and I suppose it's very hard to disagree with the, with, with those things. Who who would not want to be life affirming, compassionate, and in favor of overall well-being? Oh, lots of people. Aha, uh -huh. lots of people. We the, the I would argue that the central problem yeah. that the world faces and that my own country, our, our country face, America faces is that we have created a social order that has only one social priority, and that's profit. And so... Well, if, certainly that's what the capitalist system is, is based well, on. Well, that's the way the system operates. Yeah. Is, I mean, you know, we just rescinded a rule in, con in the American Congress that uh, during the Obama administration, they passed a rule that, you can't, that coal companies cannot dump toxic waste into valleys with streams, and they have rescinded that. Yeah. Now, the effect of that's going to be that it's it's going to adversely affect the health, not only of all the humans that, mm -hmm. are, that have contact with that water, but all the other beings on the planet yeah. that have contact well, with I, that. Well, I imagine their justification for a decision of that sort is it, it, this will create jobs. Yes, uh -huh. which means we will get more profit. Yeah. In fact, when you actually look at the social data, what you discover is that those social policies, which are compassionate and life-affirming and fostering of wellness, mm -hmm. and I cannot find a counterexample, mm -hmm. those that are compassionate and life-affirming are always cheaper, more effective, more efficient, more productive, easier to implement, nicer to live under, and more enduring. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you, like me, uh, consider ourselves social progressives. And, yes. and uh, when you use the phrase life-affirming, it's often associated with the uh, pro-life movement uh, who are uh, not considered part of the social uh, progressive camp, typically. Well, that's just a distortion of life affirming. Uh huh. I mean, I, I, what I what I usually say is wellness or well being. Yeah. And by that I mean just what you think I mean. And mm -hmm. people are healthier, happier. I, it, it's and it has huge implications. For instance, in San Francisco, they began building shelters for homeless people. Mm -hmm. Now there was a lot of freaking out. The, oh my God, this is so expensive, it's going to be terribly expensive, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, the actuality is that it turned out to be millions of dollars cheaper. Why? Because people who had a safe, clean place to live had fewer medical emergencies, they mm -hmm. went to the emergency room mm -hmm. less, they needed less social services, yeah. they needed less care of a whole spectrum of things. Mm -hmm. When we make well-being fostering choices yeah. and policies, mm -hmm. we produce outcomes, social outcomes, which are cheaper, more efficient, more effective. And, and this, this, mm -hmm. 
the arguments that you see against these things. Oh, well, that will be too expensive. Or, or I often hear the argument that uh, certain people's behavior is immoral, they should be punished, they shouldn't yes. be rewarded. Right. And so we're going to punish all those people who abuse drugs by not allowing them to get clean needles. And as a result of that decision, we are going to assure that the incidence of hepatitis C and AIDS and a host of other illnesses will, f will flourish and that will face millions and millions of dollars of, of health costs yeah. that will be borne by the general public well, some people feel, and I think I, ha I have a feeling that it, uh, to some extent it's based on what uh, Timothy Geithner called an Old Testament uh, yes. attitude that that it's more important to be right and to punish those who are wrong than to be concerned with the general welfare. Well, we're not being right, but you are. I think he's correct, or your, your statement of it is correct. There is a need to feel superior to and to punish. Mm -hmm. And when you actually look at that, I mean, the United States is, is leading the world basically in two things. Uh, military expenditures. We spend more on our military than the next seven high spending countries in the world combined. Yeah. So, we're spending this vast amount of money, which means that we don't have money for lots of other things. Mm -hmm. And we have the world's largest gulag. Mm -hmm. We are a country of prison systems. Yep. There's no other country in the world. Millions of people. Millions in, of Incarcerated. People. Exactly. And when you look at the co it costs approximately, depending on the prison, where it is located in the mm -hmm. country, blah, 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 between 26000 and $35,000 a year to incarcerate a medium security felon. Mm -hmm. Now think about that for a second. Uh, years ago, I was doing research, when, when I began doing this kind of research, I had a, a friend who was the deputy chief of police in Los Angeles, and through him, I was able to go down to the LA County Jail. Mm -hmm. And I have never, what got me started in this is I have never forgotten a conversation I had with a young black kid who was well, about 19 years old, mm -hmm. and I, I talked to this young man for well, probably a half hour, 45 mm -hmm. minutes, and I, I realized he was very bright. Yep. And I said, what in the world are you doing in jail? You are so bright, you ought mm -hmm. to be in college someplace. And he mm -hmm. said, well, I tried, but I couldn't get $2,600 support to go to college, but somehow they have $26,000 to keep me in jail. Well, if you think about the million plus people that we have in jail and that each of these people is costing twenty six to thirty five thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. we could put everybody in the country or it, 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 in college or let me give you another example that, that, that makes this point even clearer you know in the second democratic debate uh, in the recent 2016 elections Bernie Sanders made a comment about Norway and about we ought to do something like Norway. Mm -hmm. And so I got to thinking about that. And so I started looking at the social outcome data. My real interest is social outcome data because I'm not interested in your theory or your speculation mm -hmm. or your supposition about how. What I want to know is if you do this, what happens? What does what the data say? Yeah, what does the data say? I'm a data person. Yeah. And so uh, if you look at it now, here's the story. Norway ranks 11th in the world in terms of healthcare systems, mm -hmm. according to World Health Organization. So they're not the best. No. Yeah. Not the best. Mm -hmm. 11th. Mm -hmm. They spend 7.6% uh, of their GDP on healthcare. Mm -hmm. We spend 17.6% um, 18, of our GDP, and we have a healthcare system that ranks 37th. We have the highest maternal mortality yeah. of any developed country in the world. Mm -hmm. Suppose we could get to 11th and spend the same proportion of our 
uh, GDP as Norway does to get there. So America is now going to try to be 11th best, not 37th. Okay. And we're going to spend 7.6% of our GDP mm -hmm. for healthcare. What would that mean? Well, what that would mean is we would free up approximately $1.3 trillion a year. $1.3 trillion a year would send all the kids to college, would take care of elder care, and would provide all the needed prenatal care. And a lot more. Oh, and a lot more. I'll give you another yeah. example. We wouldn't need to pollute our streams. Exactly. Well, I, I mean, yes, but uh, I'll give you another example. Uh -huh. They started in Finland, and now a number of other Scandinavian countries do this. When a mother has a child, she doesn't have to do this, but she can if she wants. She can apply for what's called the baby box. Mm -hmm. And the baby box is a cardboard box that has a little mattress, and it has everything a child needs for the first year of his life. Mm -hmm. What happens when you do that? The little box costs $76. Now, they started it at a, hos at a, at a hospital in, New in uh, St. Louis, and now the state of New Jersey is going to do it. Mm -hmm. The estimate is that they will save $57,000 a year in, in early child health care as a result of that little $76 box. Mm. So we're going to put $76 out and we're going to save $57,000. You mean for each single box, the savings, yes. is that great? Yes. That's like a thousand-fold savings. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I can, I mean, there's endless yeah. examples. That's the thing. When you start, when you start thinking in terms of wellness and well-being and developing social programs that have well-being, I'll give you another example. The city, Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. decided that they wanted to make sure that everybody had high-speed internet access. And they chose to do it not through a, by making a contract with a private corporation like Comcast, but by doing it through a locally owned, cooperative, community owned electrical system. Right. EPB, EPB. Rather than doing mm -hmm. it, making a contract right. with Comcast. Mm -hmm. So they weren't supporting the capitalist economy. Yes, they were, what their goal was, a well being. Some they kind wanted, of a collective. They wanted to produce um, high-speed internet for everybody at yeah. a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. So they decided, what does that mean? Well, they decided one gigabyte of download speed. That's very fast. That means you can download, uh, the average movie on Netflix yeah. is three to five gigs, so that means that you can download a movie in three to five It's about a hundred times faster than we have here in this building. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the average in the United States, I mean, that's mm -hmm. several hundred times over the, the, yeah. the entire United States. Anyway, so they they passed this rule and they decided $69 would buy you one gig. Mm -hmm. And if you could prove financial need, that would be as low as $20. Yep. So they implemented this policy. What happened, they did not plan for. When they instituted it, then suddenly they realized that all these millennials were moving into downtown Chattanooga, which was dying. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there were all these new businesses because the businesses came because you could get this high-speed internet. And then their restaurants developed in order to service the people who used the high-speed internet who had moved mm -hmm. there. And then that meant that hotels were suddenly uh, cropping up and, and doing better because now mm -hmm. the people that came to visit, the people who had the high-speed access, Galleries, art galleries started because the people that came to visit the people and the people who had yeah. come to live there had more money. So it had a snowballing effect. Had a, it transformed the economy of Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and it was just this one, and it was orders of magnitude cheaper than the alternative that was being ordered for Comcast to such a degree that Comcast sued claiming unfair favoritism on the part of the Chattanooga city government, mm -hmm. precluding them from making their profits. Yep. So every time you do something that is compassionate and life affirming, productive of well-being, you not only get the benefits you think you're trying to get, the, the goals that mm -hmm. you're trying, 
but you get a whole raft of unintended consequences that you don't even know about, don't even anticipate. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? We're running uh, way past our normal oh, time, okay. <laughs> Stephen. Right. But this has been so engrossing and so important. I can't thank you enough. It's my pleasure. And thank you as well for being with us. Thank you.